well, first, thank you, everybody. Even though I, um, I usually see people, it's a bit weird, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll go along and uh, try to imagine all of you uh, in my living room. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the, the modern data scientist, and I'm going to start with, um, with a small anecdote. So uh, as the head of data science and machine learning at Depop, I do a lot of interviews. And at some point, I uh, stumble uh, on a, an interview and the candidate, uh, after asking a couple of questions, told me, well, I don't know what kind of data scientist you're looking for, but I'm pretty sure I'm not that kind. And uh, it kind of, today, it still makes me laugh uh, because it's, um, it's kind of framing the, not, not, not the problem, and more like a, an issue around the data scientist role. Um, because that role hasn't been around for a long time, uh, it's it's still not well defined. There's no like it's it hasn't been standardized, and data scientists for a different company means uh, something very different. Sometimes slightly different, but sometimes it's just not the same role at all, and it becomes quite hard to understand as uh, a person who wants to start their career as the data scientist or uh, somebody that is already there. Uh, <clears throat> to understand where you go, how you go, and um, how it works in companies. So uh, I'm going to give you my view of things. Uh, obviously, uh, not, not always, uh, uh, not necessarily popular, but not always the, 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 one, the same one for everybody. So um, usually when I think about the role of data scientist, I think about the role of accountability, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. And so we've all seen uh, that, that small diagram of what, what does a data scientist uh, uh, needs to do and what's kind of the workflow for data science and machine learning. So we'd got, you, you would have the research, the solution design, the analysis, the model, the deployment and the monitoring. And so, <clears throat> Some companies have uh, taken the, the split approach. Uh, they give the data scientist the first three steps, and then uh, the work is transferred to a data engineer uh, for the last two. Uh, some have taken an hybrid position uh, where you've got data scientist, data engineer, still uh, splitting those roles. And in the middle, you kind of have a bridge uh, uh, role that is called the ML engineer. And then you've got the end-to-end -end kind of approach uh, that is the data scientist does everything. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, at Depop, uh, we took the last one. Uh, for us, uh, and I mean, for me, when I joined three years ago, there was nothing. So it made sense for us to go through uh, that kind of approach of data science, because anyway, we had to build everything. So we might as well build it the way we thought was the most efficient way. So I guess what skill set do we need then uh, to be able to have those data scientists? So um, as, as you can see, there's a core of, you need to know machine learning, deep learning statistics. That is the core of the, of the skill set. And then you've got uh, the infrastructure bits, the software engineering bit, the research and the system design. And then in red, you've got um, the skills that are more soft skills, less of a, of a link to the craft of what you're doing. And, um, and all that makes a, a data scientist at Depop. And so if, if you start looking at, um, obviously you've got levels uh, when you <clears throat> you just start in your career, it sounds like you're never gonna reach that point. You're never gonna have all that experience and all those, uh, those skill sets in one go. And so the way we did it is we kind of like split the role in different level and uh, make sure that expectation were slightly different for every role. So as a junior, you will come, we'll expect you to have an aspect of research. You will have done a PhD or a master degree. You would have done some research. You will know machine learning in terms of uh, having the basics and the foundational parts of how do you build a classifier? How do you build a regression? Um, <clears throat> how do you run a, a training, a tuning job and so on? And uh, obviously statistics. And it, this, is, this is something that you carry across all levels. And then uh, when you start growing a little bit, you start acquiring uh, more software engineering skills and uh, deep learning aspect to it. Uh, and um, again, it carries across uh, uh, your mid-level to your senior level. And then the last bits you kind of add 
are actually the infrastructure side and the system design side. Because often infrastructure and system design is very much bound to where you are at and what company you are you're working for. Because a company will have a very different infrastructure, system will be different, language will be different, uh, cloud infrastructure will be different and so on. And so those are the core skills that we kind of see uh, going from junior to senior. And that's why we, we, we kind of bring people in uh, and have expectation at that level. And so <clears throat> how do we do that? Because question I get often is, how do you hire people to be data scientists to do end to end, knowing that it's already very hard to hire data scientists so if you add on top of it responsibilities that sometimes are split to data engineer, then it becomes very complicated. So what do we do? So we have a leadership. So you have role models that can show the path. You've got people that have done it before. You've got people that have the knowledge and that includes myself, but also people in the team. Um, then you've got transparency. Uh, I am very uh, straightforward with expectation. At every level, as I showed, uh, we have an expectation of what you need to be able to do. Then if you know that is the expectation, then it makes it, it makes it a lot easier to understand what you have to do, what you have to learn. You need to hire the right people. You need to, to hire people that are willing, willing to operate in those settings. It's, it's absolutely fine uh, to give me the first quote I give you. Like, you know, if it's not your thing to do it that way, then it's absolutely fine. That means we're not, we're not right for each other. It's like a, you know, it's like a Tinder match. We don't match, that's fine. Um, and uh, the, the last part is about having the right infrastructure in place. When I say we do end to end, I don't mean we just go build a model, build infrastructure around it, and then for the next model, we redo it again. We try to do it a little bit more smarter than that. <clears throat> and so what we do is we build frameworks. So those frameworks, they enable data scientists to deploy different models using a very similar or the same infrastructure. And that, that enable us a lot of things. Uh, and what, what have we done with that? And what have we done with that view of a, a data scientist role? is it, it actually enable us a lot of things. It enable us to deliver across a lot of different teams. At Depop, there's about eight or nine different uh, product team. Uh, some of them might not use machine learning, but most of them do. And uh, also different domains. We do NLP, computer vision, search engines, uh, recommendation engine, all that it's different, uh, different type of models, different type of infrastructure. And we enable that uh, by having that end-to-end -end kind of aspect. Also, we enable and empower data scientists to own the machine learning roadmap and the delivery of it. You give a lot of flexibility by saying, because you're going to do the end to end, you got to be comfortable with what you're doing, but you also kind of acquire the ownership of the, of the machine learning roadmap and delivery. And uh, for, for us, it has been uh, also about working more efficiently and a faster pace. Because if you know you're gonna do everything, you don't have to uh, yes between team. You don't have to make sure that, you know, when you finish, somebody's gonna be ready to take over from you because it's gonna be you. So when you finish, you continue and you do the, the next part and it's it's all fine. And so for, for, for Depop, it has been very successful to look at data scientists in that kind of uh, uh, framework. So yeah, so that, that that's it for me. Perfect. Thank you very much, Clemens. Absolute professional as well. Finished bang on 10 minutes. Yeah. This is this is the professional speaking. So thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll keep this bit going quite quickly and uh, we'll, we'll save the questions for the end. Uh, so Clemens, if I could ask you to turn off your camera and uh, your mic, uh, we'll invite Armin uh, to turn on his camera and his microphone now. Hey, Armin, you're still Hello, muted, everyone. my friend. There you go. This is good. Mate, that's a nice background you've got there. I like that. Yes, I manage it. <laughs> uh, Armin is the Senior Data Science Manager at Booking.com. Uh, keeping the theme going, it's all about building careers in tech, structuring teams and that sort of stuff. And uh, Armin's going to be uh, talking about uh, guidelines for building uh, your career. Um, if you're happy, Armin, uh, as I say, keeping it moving, uh, I'll get to share your screen, uh, which looks good. So if you're happy, uh, I'll leave you to it. Do you see it now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, have um, a good one. I'm going to start with a story. I think everyone loves a story. And this is a real story, actually. So once upon a time, there was a talented, hardworking guy called John, and who wanted to become a data scientist. 
After some job search, he succeeded to get a position of junior data scientist in a very well-reputed company that you may guess what it is. However, the company at that early stages of developing data-driven product needed someone who do a lot of data engineering, data wrangling, and, and making the pipeline of data happening. So when John joined, he delivered a very excellent job and he managed to create a lot of data pipeline that we needed. So this was, the, as a result of that, he got a really excellent uh, job review. He get a salary increase and he get a bonus as you may expect. And then two years after, when I, this is where I start in this uh, story, when I come to this story, what happened was that John no longer was happy with his job. And the reason was he wanted to get a promotion, but it was not happening. The committee was refused to get him a promotion to a data, uh, data scientist. And the problem was that he slipped into a role of data engineer and it was not, the company was asking him to do, to have this role. So the moral of this story is that you start with a carry, you start with a job position, and then uh, depending on what kind of project you get along and what happened, you may, you may get away into areas that it is not what you intended from the beginning. So that's why for me, uh, any job that any job that you have or any career that you want to have is just like a journey. And you have to, for this journey, you have to get ready. One of the most important things we need for a journey is to, is to having a map. And if, if you don't know exactly what is your final destination is going to be in five years time or 10 years time, it's still, it's very beneficial to know exactly where am I heading for the next year? Where I'm going to be in, in two years time from now? And because of that, this is just one example that I put for myself, a personal career map. And this is any stop or position that, depending on where I'm starting, is going to show me what are the reachable areas that might get along on my way and I can just grasp, grab it. In this example, you may see that, uh, for example, John started as an internship in, in one company and then he get in, interested in, in data and the world, the world of data science. But he's, he worked as a reporting analyst and then he get hired as a junior data scientist. And then without noticing, he fall into a data engineer. But when he noticed that he need to move to a different po uh, position, th there was a gap that he needed to fill in. So he started to work on, on the gap, the thing that is required to happen to become a, pro a data scientist, what we call as a data scientist product. Someone who's really strong on making a data science product uh, happening and automation is happening. And as a result of that, when, he, when we notice that exactly where we are going to be in our career, next step and next step, then we can find out if either we are going to move horizontally or we are going to move uh, vertically to just expand our skills and move on in this career path. But um, I'm not going to talk too much about what kind of things we need, but everybody knows that for, for a position of data science, you need to have a triple decker kind of toolbox. You have to work hard on your core software skills, including the ownership, uh, sense of ownership, team spirit, um, adapt to the changes and problems, problem solving sort of prob um, uh, skills, software skills, as well as understanding the commercial part, which is really crucial. If you don't know the field knowledge, if you cannot work really well with the stakeholders, it's going to be a very big challenge. You cannot move on really well. And the craftsmanship is the area that you have to put on more and more on this uh, uh, toolbox that you have. But the, for the people who are starting this career, my message is that when you start your career path, this toolbox is almost empty or more or less empty. So you need to acquire of these skills on the way. And, and the way of doing it is just by being on the journey, enjoying it and learning and learning and learning. So you have to be a lifetime continuous learner to have a read, to enjoy your journey as well as acquiring all the skills and, and, and tools that you need for this, for this journey. But I put in, uh, because I'm coming from the uh, engineering background, there is a cycle of continuous improvement that I adopted for any success in the, in the career as well. So for me, the very first step of these four step uh, continuous uh, improvement cycle is, um, is to identify. And a practical approach for this is that 
adopting um, adopting any steps that you need to understand what is going to be my next stop. I put some question here that it may help you to answering this question may, may help you to to find out what is going to be your next stop. For example, you you may say what will be my next reachable role given the, the strengths and, and the skills that I have? Or what do, you, what do I want as my next job? How does it feel on a typical day of that role? Or how is it aligned with my interest? Or a question of who is in that role? Who is in that role that I can see it now and I can just go and consult with him? And finally, what kind of skills are used the most in that role? When you answer this question, then you go to the next stage, which is the planning stage. In the planning stage, you need to simply find the list of the skills and knowledge that is required for that role, and then match those skills with your current status. But prioritization is really important in that aspect. So you need to understand which of those missing or the lack of gap or the gap that you have found is the most important one to fill if you're going to move toward that skills. And, and then for this, you have to uh, you have to think of different ways that you can go for it. But once you plan it, then the time is coming for the action. You have to actively seek and, and learning. And this is, uh, data science is just like a tennis. You cannot just read, read, read. You have to play, practice, and, and doing it. But what I'm suggesting in the action uh, stage is by adopting a rule of 70-20-10. 70 70% 70 by doing, practicing, and getting involved with the project. 20% is with communication with mentors, peers, and trainers. And only 10% would be self-reading or watching document. Or even if you watch some training courses, you have to make your hands dirty because you learn by doing, not just by reading and watching. And the, the very last one is the review. This is the time that you need to uh, understand, reflect back and understand what has happened. Am I getting closer or not? And the people who are going to help you with that is that, seeking for uh, feedback, uh, ask for your uh, peers, your manager, your stakeholders, and, and look, look up yourself to, to see whether it helped you to strengthen your strength, to fill the gap between what you didn't know. And, and then also uh, find out, what, am I getting closer? And what else do I need to find out about myself that is actually good? And when you review yourself and see if you are getting closer, then finally go back to the identify again, because you really may need to answer this important question. With, with the knowledge that I have now about myself, about the things that I've learned, is the stop that I, I'm, I'm looking for is the one that I want to be there? And if this is the case, just carry on with the plan, execute, and review. And this is going to be your guidelines for success in your career at Data Science World. Perfect, thanks very much, Armin. Uh, very sensible tips there, and I'm sure a lot of people have taken taken that away from them. So th thank you very much. No problem. Uh, as I say, we'll keep the questions for the end uh, and move on. So yeah, if you could turn off your camera and mic, uh, I'll invite Tamara uh, to come and say hello to everyone. Hello, Tamara. Hello. Uh, so Tamara is VP Data and Insights at Unidays, um, worked at a number of e-commerce uh, enterprise level companies, so very much looking forward to hearing uh, from you. Um, Tamara is going to be talking about advancing your career uh, beyond the technical. Uh, so if I could ask you to share your screen. No problem. Get out your way, because nobody wants to see me, do they? Let's face it. Um, awesome. So that's looking good. Uh, if you're happy, uh, I'll leave you to it, Tamara. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, firstly, thanks everyone for having me here today. So I'm the VP of Data and Insight at UniDays. For those of you that don't know who UniDays are, we are a student affinity network. We verify student identity globally, and through that, students have access um, through our platform to discounts, content, giveaways with all the various brand partners that we work with. But in my role, I manage and, and hire a lot of data engineers and data scientists. And so as part of this talk, what I want to share with you is Firstly, if you're looking at advancing your career, why it's important to invest in the broader capabilities alongside your, your technical skills. And secondly, 
to give you some tips and advice very much from my own perspective on how you can um, get stand out at interview and, and on your CVs. But firstly, I want to sort of make a statement that your job is simply not to be a data scientist or a data engineer. It might be your title, but it's not necessarily, it's not the reason why you were hired. The reason you were hired was to create business value, leveraging your skills as a data scientist or a data engineer. And now I know value is one of these words that kind of gets banded around an awful lot and can be quite ambiguous to define. And of course, it can be very different depending on the type of business you work for. Creating value could be through improving certain KPIs like revenue or the number of customers. It could be through saving costs. It could be through saving people's time, but it also could be through creating opportunity. And what I mean by that is a data science platform on its own doesn't do very much, but a data science platform that is being used by data scientists to build models obviously creates opportunity to improve KPIs, save costs, save time. So to come back to my point that your job is about creating value, whilst I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you, that's how you sort of introduce yourself if you're asked what your job is, it can sound a little self-indulgent. It's important to understand because when your role was created or the role that you're applying for was created, it was inevitably to do at least one, if not all of these things. But if you've been doing a data job before or you've done it as your studies, you'll realize that sometimes doing it and getting to this sort of magical end state of value is actually quite hard. There's a lot of pesky things that can stand in our way. And if you were to reflect on some of your projects that you've done and think about what was it about those projects that caused it to be unsuccessful, I'm going to bet my bottom dollar that in a lot of instances, it wasn't your technical competence that prevented you from getting there. So what are some of these other things that can kind of get in our way? Well, firstly, do we have a clear purpose for that project? Do, you know, is it clear how people are meant to be using this and it's going to add value? Do we have the data? Is it available? Is it reliable? Is the technology we're using um, suitable for the analysis, but also is the technology and the business in place to actually implement the solution you're proposing? And then the business, are they willing or able to change based on what you're putting forward. And so if you've worked in data before or experienced any of this, then congratulations, um, this, is, this is what it's just like. And so, and, and we see these things all the time. And whilst technical skills will certainly help you in some of these areas, it's certainly not gonna be the only thing you're gonna need to get yourself around these situations. So what are some of these other skills or attributes you need to bring forward to um, enhance your technical skills. And some of these um, quite nicely have already been referred to by some of our other speakers. The way I like to think about it is knowledge, skills and attributes. And whilst I won't go into all of these, you've seen them before, they probably exist on um, your job description. I want to give you an example. So let's say you've been working on a project and through some data or exploration, you've realized that you are able to predict which brands your customers are most likely to shop with. Well, that sounds like a really useful thing to be able to put into any targeted communication that we're looking to do to try and increase conversion or sales. And so you kind of get to the end of the, the development of your project and you've created this model and it's brilliant, it's really accurate. And you take it to um, the technical teams to try and get that into your CRM tool only to find out that the CRM solution that you have in the business doesn't actually enable you to do triggered communications based off of changes of those sorts of attributes or certainly without a lot of dev investment up front. And when you go to the marketing team to ask them to provide content to go into these emails, you find out that they are being heavily targeted with generating new, new customers. And so they've not got any time to spend on your initiative. They've got their own targets that they're working towards. And so very quickly, this project that you're working on, which is clearly a very like valuable, useful thing, could not reach its end goal of achieving value because 
it's not really quite aligned to where the teams are spending their time at the moment. And it doesn't quite fit in with the technical solution that the business has in place. But all is not necessarily lost. This is where, how do you leverage your problem solving skills to maybe change the way that the model works a little bit so that it can be more fitting with what the CRM tool does? Or how do you use your communication skills to sell a story to the marketing leads and influence them to um, free up some resource to invest in this initiative that ultimately will help drive more revenue? And then there's all these attributes that kind of underpin a lot of these things. We do a technical role. And so it's quite unlikely that people within the business are going to be able to give us like that clear brief. It's our curiosity and our attention to detail that helps us to ask those questions and make sure that we've got a clear purpose to the work that we're doing. And with all of these challenges we may face, it's our resilience and being open minded that will help us sort of pivot and evolve to make sure that we deliver something even if it's not necessarily 100% of what we were aiming for at the beginning. And so there's lots of things you're going to need to be able to draw upon to be successful in delivering within data. And so investing in these kind of skills, as well as your technical skills, is of equal importance, especially if you are looking to grow into, um, into a technical lead or be a manager or be you know, a head of department, because when your team inevitably runs into some of these problems, it's gonna be you that they turn to, to help them work through it. So where, where do you go from here? Um, so I would love to spend loads of time talking about how to develop some of these skills, um, but I will get booted off shortly um, so it'll be a, a conversation for another day but I would say as a starting point it's really important to map out the projects that you've done um, aligned with the, the skills that are required of you within your role or the job that you're applying for and map out what where have you had the opportunity to demonstrate some of these skill sets if nothing else at least you're building up your evidence bank for those inevitable um, competency-based questions that you're going to get at interview stage. But I would also suggest that when you're going through this exercise is ask yourself, were those projects delivered successfully? If so, why? If not, why? Because it's through that that will give you those um, sort of insights and those identify those opportunities of where you may need to grow, set, grow your skill sets further. And actually, once you've got identified those things, you can use Armin's wonderful um, uh, sort of continuous improvement cycle and use that to help your process of developing those skills. But I wouldn't just look at it in terms of your own self-reflection. Um, it's useful to consider what other people did within the team to help deliver these projects successfully, particularly if it's in your, your peers or your managers, because it may give you some insight as to what it might be needed of you at the level above. So then when it gets to your CV, this really is your opportunity to tell hiring managers all of the skills and qualities that you are going to bring to the role. So when I see a lot of CVs and it comes to skills, I see a lot of lists of technical skills and that's very, very useful. But I would also encourage you to include the other skills that you have that are gonna be needed within the role. Even within my own CV, I've got under skills, my technical skills, but I also talk about things like team management or project management or budgeting, because those are all the things I also need to be able to do to be successful in the role. And to come back to my point around your role being about creating value, tell us on your CV about where you've created that value. From a business perspective, tell us where you have increased KPIs or saved time. If you're able to quantify it even better, because what this says to me is that firstly, that you value um, producing tangible results, but also that if you've managed to get to the end of the project and, um, and managed to deliver some hard results, it means that you have successfully navigated these challenges that you will have inevitably faced. And then when you get to the interview stage, there is a reason why um, hiring managers ask you questions like, 
tell us about a time when you had a challenging stakeholder. Tell us about a time where you had to overcome a data challenge because we know that those are the things you're going to experience in the role that you're applying for. And so we want to hear about how you've overcome those. It's easy to talk in general terms about how you might go about it, but it's a lot more convincing and memorable to tell us about a real example that you have experienced. And finally, um, when it comes to asking questions, this is your opportunity to find out a lot more about the team and where your role fits within it. So we get a lot of questions around what tools and technology did the team use, but ask us about your role and where it fits. Because firstly, it shows some interest and understanding that where you are coming into the business fits into a bigger picture. But it also ultimately gives you more information to determine whether this is the right role for you. So just finally, there is a lot of wonderful, wonderful things about being in a career in data, but it's certainly not always plain sailing. And so for a hiring manager, we want to make sure that you're as motivated and committed to all aspects of the role, the, the technical and the non-technical parts of it. And you haven't chosen to take a career in data um, because um, without loving the technical side of it. That's ultimately why we do what we do, but it's really demonstrating these softer capabilities that will get you to stand out. Thank you. Perfect, thanks very much, Tamara. Uh, really clear, concise and practical tips. So yeah, looking forward to getting to the questions. I'm sure there's gonna be a few there for you uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I could invite Fergus uh, to join uh, now. Uh, just quickly before Fergus gets started, uh, we're in double digits in terms of the questions, uh, which is great to see, uh, but please do keep them coming because looking forward to the, the panel at the end. So um, the screen looks good, Fergus. Uh, so if you're happy, uh, I'll get out of the way. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm actually going to cover a little bit of what everybody else has covered, um, which is uh, kind of exciting to see from my perspective, um, given that uh, we haven't actually worked or collaborated on our talks together, but individually. Um, so I'm currently the Director of Data and Analytics at Future Publishing. And previous to moving to Future, I was at Trainline where I built out the data science function and data science team. Um, today is going to be very brief for me. I just want to kind of give you, I want to leave, I want to leave you with kind of two thoughts. One is a consideration for the type of business that you may be applying for um, and the implication that that may have on the type of data science role that you might walk into. And then two, I'm just gonna share at a very high level the framework I've used in the past when putting together a data science team. Um, because as all of my kind of peers have mentioned that data science is a very broad term. Um, and when you're putting a data science team together, you need to be able to break that up into smaller chunks to know how to put them together into a fully fledged and fully functioning high performance uh, data science team. So I think the first question um, you need to ask is kind of what type of business is it? And I've just noticed my typo. Um, so when I say what type of business, there's a kind of a sliding scale of the type of business that you're gonna walk into. Um, they're either going to be on the left-hand side, very much a research driven business where the return on investment, either from a, a capital expenditure point of view or an expectation um, of deploying their uh, resources is gonna be somewhere in the region of you know, three plus years. Um, and on the total opposite side of this scale is a commercially driven business where the return on investment is much more, much more like three months. Um, and both of these, um, sides, there are businesses that exist on both of these sides, um, but more often than not, most businesses sit somewhere in the middle. Um, and it's really important to understand what type of business you're walking into. And I'll give an example um, of a business that can be every that, that can sit on both sides, um, something like Google or Amazon, where they are a hugely commercially driven business, but they do apply a lot of capital expenditure to also doing research. So you, while you might go to be a data scientist at Google, depending on where you land in the organization, um, really has a big influence on the type of work you're going to do um, within that business. 
And the second thing I wanted to really share is kind of the framework that I've used in the past um, when building data science teams out to ensure that there's balance within the team and that all of the kind of core competencies are addressed for, because I don't really ever think that there is a unicorn data scientist or a unicorn data engineer. Um, I think if they are, if they, if, you know, if they do exist, they don't exist in the UK or Europe, they probably exist in the West Coast working at, um, working at Airbnb or Uber. Um, so the first thing, obviously, as everybody else has mentioned as well, um, core competency is mathematics and statistics. And then you've got your program, programming and, and databases, your domain knowledge and your soft skills, and your ability to communicate and visualize. Um, as you move further away from the center, that's, that's uh, basically the axis of increasing in specialism. So on the top left and the top right, you might have a research scientist whose kind of core responsibility is very much focused within that bucket of mathematics and statistics. They don't really need to understand the world of programming and databases, having domain knowledge or being able to communicate and visualize. And then you have other roles which kind of sit somewhere in the middle. Um, so the classic one um, is the machine learning engineer, which is somewhere between a data scientist or a research scientist and a software engineer. A visualization engineer is somebody who has the ability to uh, do web development, do development within R or within Python with visual, with visual libraries, um, but then also to be able to tell a story. You've got the product analyst who you know, needs some sort of competency within maths and, and statistics, not at the same level as a research scientist, but also needs to have the ability to understand the domain, have the commercial acumen and business awareness to kind of put those stories together. And then you've got the product manager where they very much sit within the realms of understanding the business, understanding what drives the business, and then being able to package that up into a story to influence stakeholders such that the change, uh, change any changes that do get made are in the right direction. And they tend to sit further away from the technical side, which is what I would say on the top. Um, so, and that's really kind of all I wanted to share. Like none of this, what I put together is really new. Lots of people have done infographics that go into much more detail in terms of how you break each of these buckets down. Um, but what I would say to you is, as you walk into an interview, know where, about, you, want, know where you sit in your current core capabilities and, and kind of your, your level. Um, and then understand, I suppose, from a career development perspective, which way do you want to move? Um, I, I would I would argue that the the top the the top half of this chart is very much what you may learn at university or through a master's or through a PhD, and the bottom half is going to be very much through either work experience, actually industry experience, or doing an MBA or some sort of um, uh, some so, sort of business follow on degree. Um, but to some degree, you're not going to be everything on this chart. You're going to be two or three things and you're going to have a, probably a strong lean in one way or one direction or the other. So that's it for me. Thank you. Much, Fergus. I always love getting your input, as you know. So uh, really pleased to have you here today, mate. So thanks very much for that. Uh, if I could invite all of the panelists uh, just to turn back on their uh, cameras. Uh, we'll jump into some of these questions uh, and I'll do my best uh, to make a good job of, uh, uh, of going through them. Um, Fergus, if you want to come back, uh, it'd be good to have you here as well because uh, I've definitely got a few questions for you, mate, 100%. Um, okay, where to start with this? There is a lot of questions. So um, each of the panellists, you can actually see the Q&A uh, function as well. Uh, I might jump around a little bit if you want to read along. Um, but um, we'll go from there. Um, in terms of directing questions, I'll do my best to direct questions where possible. There may be times where I'll come to all four of you actually, because I, I think it's particularly relevant. Um, the first question there at the very top, it's been directed to Clements initially, but I probably will come to each of you uh, to get your take on this, because each of you have talked about this. Um, so the question comes in from uh, Sean McGuire. Uh, he's saying, um, in terms of the non-technical skills, uh, each of you have mentioned, obviously, they're important. Do you believe that these non-technical skills can be taught uh, or only learned on the job? Uh, so I'll come to you first, Clemens, as it was directed to you, uh, and then we'll go from there. I think, uh, I think any skill can be taught. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, um, uh, bound to non-technical skills. Um, Obviously, on the job, 
you have to learn them. It's not a can you learn them or not. You kind of have to. So I think I think yes, it can be taught, but practice is always the best way of thinking of looking if you actually have learned those skills or not. So I think you will need both, but you to everything there is a theory to it. So you should be able to get the grasp of the theory and then apply it on the job. But I think a lot of it is transferable. It doesn't have to be a job of as a data scientist uh, that gives you that specific communication. You communicate with people every day. Those are skills you can transfer uh, from uh, from uh, your everyday life to your business. Obviously, the, the, the vocabulary might be different, but the aspect of getting your point across, being able to speak clearly to, mm -hmm. to people and explain something, uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, transferable. You might be a big fan of, uh, let's say, uh, basketball. Uh, if you start explaining to somebody how basketball works and what are the rules of basketball, you're already making a big step in communication. And you will do the same thing, explaining what a neural network do and whatever, you know, what, how it works. It would be different things you're transmitting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Tamara, in terms of the softer skills, uh, I, I might even, you know, elaborate on the question. Have you got any tips uh, for data scientists, you know, in terms of having this awareness? Because I think sometimes you think of very technical people as perhaps, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have these wider skills. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would firstly, yes, I would agree with the original with Clements in terms of you can, it can be taught, um, you know, as a, as a starting point. And, you know, we see that there is loads of um, courses out there you, from on, online learning platforms around communication, storytelling, or influencing skills. I mean, there's yeah, a whole host of books on things to do with influencing skills. Um, I mean, project management is a is a is a capability that's got a number of different qualifications that you can get alongside it. So, absolutely, um, they are they are things that you can you can learn. Um, for me personally, I actually do quite like doing online courses, um, like I use a LinkedIn learning or I'll use other sort of online resources if I just want to get myself a bit of a baseline on some of these things. And then anything I want to take in a bit more detail, I might get a book. Um, I'm, I'm always a big fan of reading books around certain subjects. And then, but the, the real thing is obviously putting these things into practice and, um, and, and also adapting and tweaking that for the context of your organization, whatever might have been an appropriate communication style in one business might be quite different and recognizing that and being able to shift and adjust is probably as important as a skill in of itself. But I would say finally, you know, it's, it's all good, to, well and good to like almost book learn in a sense and, and do that practice, but be open to getting that feedback because, you know, I may think I'm great at something and I may continue to think I'm great at something until somebody tells me I'm not. And, and being open to hearing that and, and adjusting it is really what's going to help you develop. Perfect. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan myself, but it, it can be hard to give that criticism some, sometimes, can't it? But um, we'll jump on to you, Armin, uh, and then I'll, I'll maybe even come to you, Fergus, or I may jump onto another question and start the next question with you. So uh, I'll come to you next, Armin. Uh, in terms of the non-technical skills, what, what are your thoughts around that in terms of building a career and how important they are and how can people learn them? Tamara and, and Clemens, they said all the things that is necessary. So I'm not uh, taking a lot of time. I, the only thing I'm going to add is making sure that put your stress on can be learned rather than can be taught. Because teaching, as Tamara said, is just a starting point. And it is exactly that 10% that I was talking about. Only 10% of it is by teaching. You have to start learning it by doing it and the feedback is really important so ask ask your people to give you feedback once people tell you exactly on a spot then you start to get the mindful of it and when you get the mindful of it and then it gradually come to your dna to your body to your cells and everything help you to do things in a way that you want it to do perfect thanks Armin. Uh, I'll come to you, Fergus, actually. So kind of carrying on that conversation there, we're talking about feedback now, uh, taking that honest feedback and improving, uh, working out where you need to learn and stuff like that. I've not come to you because I can imagine you're very good at it, uh, but how important is a mentor uh, in terms of when you're building a career? Is it something that you look to do internally within your team? Should people look for mentors within their peer group? Should they actively outreach for people? Uh, do, do you think that's something that would be important? Yeah, I do. I think 
it's incredibly important. The way I think about it is um, as a mentor, kind of is somebody like they're they're kind of paving the road forwards for you in a way right so they're kind of your lighthouse and you you have to walk that road and you may you may your your kind of path along that road might vary over time but I suppose you can lean on your the way I think about a mentor is that you can lean on them to ensure you're keeping on track Mm -hmm. um and what another thing I would say is because the kind of title of data scientist is so ill-defined that you may be facing difficulties in areas that not may, not very many other people have and having that other person to get their viewpoint on and their input can be really helpful in you working out um, working out your own thoughts so a classic example is that you've been working on a piece of code for three hours and you can't move forwards you get up from your desk you go to Clemens or Aman and, or Tamira and on your way over there you're like, oh, all right, hold on, I got it all of a sudden, right? So it's just being able to step out of yourself, listen to somebody else, or even just stepping out of yourself and taking a second to understand the probably the what you're struggling with from a different point of view. But I, yeah, I do agree, especially in the teams I build, I try and build, um, and I'm sure the other guys do, is you always kind of have a lead and then you always kind of hire your lead or put your lead in the position where they have people reporting into them such that, the ju- you don't put a junior into a team that has no guidance so the lead is always there to continue to be that mentor um and without that your kind of scientists that sit underneath them or your your, your employees that sit underneath them will kind of just be trying to find the road and they might not necessarily stay on track without that kind of mentor or lead yeah makes sense makes sense uh, i'll come back to you tomorrow um, and then we'll, we'll flick on to clements and armin with a different question after this one at, at uni days I'm guessing you have similar structures in terms of people that are able to mentor more junior people as they're coming through. Uh, so it'd be good to hear about that. Uh, it'd also be nice, I don't know if, if you personally uh, have any mentors, has that helped you in building you know, your career path? What does your career path look like and, and ha- have you had support along the way? Um, so I'll answer the last question first in that, yes, I do have a, a mentor. Um, and I remember feeling quite nervous about asking someone to be a mentor. Like I felt like I was imposing upon them, asking them to spend their time giving me advice. And um, this is somebody I, I, you know, I know quite well. And they were actually like delighted to be able to support and help. And 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 thinking about it, if somebody asked me to, to mentor them, I'd be, you know, delighted because ultimately we want people to be successful in this field. And if we feel that we can contribute to that in some way, then, then we want to do that. That's ultimately why we're sat here right now sharing some of our some of our thought, thoughts. So if you've identified people that you think would be good mentors for you, I really would encourage you to reach out to them. Um, and especially if they're outside of the organization, I think that's helpful. I'm not saying they have to be, but because they're going to be independent in some ways, um, you know, around some of your, your, you know, your career thoughts. Um, to the first question, yeah, we, I, I've invested actually quite a bit in getting um, technical mentoring for the team. We've, um, and as Dave, you'll know, we've been through quite an adjustment in terms of the type of work that the team have been doing. We've invested a lot of um, into our infrastructure, which has created an awful lot more capability for the team, um, but they weren't necessarily trained on being able to do some of those things. And so I've leveraged internal, but also got a, a program of mentorship um, from external people to come in and, and offer like two days a month, you know, they can bring their projects to them and get that outside perspective. And that's worked really well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to jump on to the next question. I'll come to you first, Clements, and then I'll go straight to you uh, afterwards, Armin, if that's okay. Uh, questions come in from Shirley. Um, Shirley is essentially asking, you know, how, how important is a PhD uh, to, to be in a data scientist. There's, there's a few more questions about taking that first step, which, which will come to as a bit of a theme. Uh, but in terms of that PhD background, how important is that? Uh, and, and what's your view on that, Clemens? Um, so it's not. Uh, a PhD is a good tool. Uh, it's 
you know, it, it, it shows a certain level of uh, ability to do research, uh, expertise in a field, but uh, usually you do a PhD in something that is very niche in the domain. It's a very small question. Often there's five people in the world that actually understand what you're saying. You know, I'm pushing the, 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 the envelope here, but, you know, it, it's, it's so, so specific that, yeah, you, you are the expert there, but it doesn't, it, it's not going to save you when you need to do a, an algorithm. So I, I don't think the PhD is a, is a mark of any, uh, any data scientist be, being better than another one. Um, and I think education is, is a good way of getting the, the, the basics in place. Uh, and it, it's been the case for a long time. But I, I even think that sometimes people that might not have any, any university degree might be very, very capable because it's not about uh, just the skills you've been able to, uh, uh, to learn at uni and uh, know by heart, but it, there's, there's so much like application to it, wanting to learn, being curious, all that is super important. And uh, we actually do that at Depop. We've got programs where uh, we get people that didn't go to university, uh, might have, uh, have uh, up to the, the I never know the name of the final level of, uh, of high school in, in the UK, but they reached that point, but they never get uh, got, uh, went further than that for often socioeconomic uh, reason more than anything else. And we're giving them a chance and they are often the best performers after that. So it is not a, uh, that, that's definitely not a blocker for me. Uh, and when I see companies saying, if you don't have a PhD, you can't do that. Well, I don't have a PhD. Okay, I've got a master. I've got a master from a university, a, a good university. I've studied overseas. I've been very lucky. But at the end of the day, it's not the blocker. The blocker is wanting to learn, being there, and wanting to take the time to do it. Perfect. That makes sense. Uh, I'll come to you, Armin, uh, to take your opinion. How, how important is a PhD uh, to being a data scientist? I'm glad you're asking me this question because I was the one who was in academia getting my PhD and then becoming a data scientist afterwards. And I can uh, see from my experience that being at the business is helping much more than being at the university in, in academia. It doesn't mean it's, it's not good to have a PhD. That's, that's definitely it's good. It's just like having a certificate. As Kellerman says, if you have a PhD, it means that you have a certificate that you can run a research and you can accomplish that. So that's that's a good thing. But now come to, come to the business and see if you can deliver a result as well. So it's not a blocker. For recruitment, I don't care if someone has a PhD or doesn't. I just care about other factors. Okay. And I guess playing devil's advocate a little bit, uh, you know, obviously we work with a lot, a lot of companies and some companies we work with, are, it's a prerequisite, the PhD, some, some venture capitalists, when they're building teams, they're, they must have a certain number of PhDs in the organization and stuff like that. Um, do you notice, uh, so that it's not necessarily a requirement for you, do you notice a difference in spending that five years doing research, you know, in terms of where people end up going as a data scientist, or it just makes no difference at all in your opinion, Armin? No, it makes difference because I, I, I know how to do research and when it, yeah. it comes to the research mindset, of course, it's going to yeah. help. So that, course, yeah. as I said, it, it's, it's actually helping, but it's not a block. Yeah. It's not a blocker. And, and at Booking.com, we don't do that. It is not a requirement at all. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Uh, in terms of the next question, we've got a lot along this theme. So I'm actually going to come to all of you. Uh, so be prepared. And it, whoever wants to come to this one first, pl please let me know. So we, we, the, the particular question is coming from uh, Teresa. Um, and she's talking about, you know, making a career change. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking to get into data science, you know, even changing from a data analyst to a data scientist or perhaps even wider uh, skills. Uh, you know, what, what would be your one tip uh, in terms of people that are looking to career change uh, and, and move into data science? Um, who would like to go first? I'm going to pick one of you if no one puts a hand up. I'm happy to have the thoughts shared with and after that I'll, I'll open it. I think Emily wanted to say something. Um, I think there's, for me, there's a couple of things. I've, I've, I've been in a in position where um, I get application from people for uh, even more for junior or mid-level um, position where uh, they, they've been doing something else. And I guess the first thing is, what is the something else? Uh, you, you mentioned a, a, a data analyst wanting to be a data scientist versus um, somebody that has done, I don't know, 
uh, biology and uh, even biology you can you can find some data science in there but uh, you know something further away from data and i guess that that that's kind of the the idea uh, i i remember somebody coming for, with to me with a like a i don't know five or six years of finance experience uh and and they didn't really understand why I was telling them they were junior because they were already five years in their career. And I think you, if you if you if you want to do career change, you have to be very uh, understand. You know, you have to understand that you have a set of skills that are transferable. We were talking about it. Those um, communication skills, those softer skills, they are there if you already worked in a business to some extent. But your technical skills, at the end of the day, as Tamara said, we we doing a technical job. So we still have to be able to get those skills in. So if you want to, to transfer, there's, there's courses you can do, but it's also being willing to accept a position that might not be at the level you were expecting because you got to learn a certain set of things before that. Perfect. Tamara? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree. Um, it, it does very much depend on what, when you're saying a career change, where you're coming from um and of course if you're in a role um at the moment it's always you know there might be areas where you're touching upon elements that are applicable to it so even if you're in a product role you're probably doing some analysis and analytics as, as part of that if you're in finance as Clemence has men men mentioned you may be having to interact with databases and pulling out financial data and maybe have some sql things so looking at what you're doing at the moment and what parts of that those things are transferable to the role as a data scientist is, is obviously really key to sort of bring that information across as you're sort of um, you know applying for those roles and then where you have those gaps like, um, like we said there's lots of online resources out there so um, and, and I wouldn't necessarily go straight away to like really complicated sort of machine learning start with some of the basic stuff of sort of you know understanding sql and, and data manipulation or data exploration you know and get start building up some of those foundational skills because if you're starting a, a career change and going into an entry-level role those are ultimately the things you're going to be doing on those day-to-day -day, um you know at that in that job anyway so starting with those sort of baseline skills would be my recommendation perfect now, armin is there any tips, uh, one tip from you in terms of transitioning into data, be it within data or from external? Yeah. Start with data scientist mindset, start to gather data. First of all, make sure that uh, with best of knowledge and consulting with people, with career advisor, with, uh, with career coach, with, uh, with mentor, with someone who's in that job, gather as much as information to understand where you are going to step in and make sure that it is aligned with your strength and if you think about it, that makes your heart beat faster. It, it, it tells you you're passionate about it. So if you are passionate about it, it's aligned with your strength, and you have sufficient data that this is the, the journey you're going to take, be brave and do it. Perfect. I like that. Be brave. Jump in. Make it happen. Uh, Fergus? Um, yeah, I think the one thing I kind of look for more and more often in somebody who's starting new or somebody who doesn't have that much experience um, and thinking about their day to day is like people's ability to uh, use SQL. I think it's a really underrepresented skill within kind of being a data analyst, a product analyst. Um, more often, the businesses that you go into will have some form of database, be it a traditional relationship database or some big cluster sitting over there that you need to interrogate. Um, but a little bit like the people's ability in a business to use Excel. Um, I think within data analytics um, and kind of the lower level data science roles, I think what I'd love to see more of as people come in for those junior roles is um, a higher level of capability within SQL. So I, I, from my perspective, I think it's a really core skill set to have because you're always going to have to take data from somewhere, right? It's not a Coursera course or a um, Kaggle competition where somebody gives you a nice clean CSV of data and says, go ahead and figure this out now, please. Yeah. It's much yeah. in the real world, it's you got to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. it makes makes good sense, makes good sense. And one of the things I've seen is when people are making that transition within data roles, it can sometimes be easier to do it within the same company. 
uh, you know, if you're trying to change from a data analyst to data scientist, it actually can be quite difficult to do that change in organizations. But if, you know, if you're at booking.com and doing a good job as an analyst and you can work your way into a data scientist role, it can, can be a little bit easier. And um, just in terms of um, uh, wrapping things up from, from the, you know, people getting into data science for the first time, I, I was hoping to go maybe for another five or 10 minutes, guys, if, if that's okay with you. There's, yeah. there's a lot to talk about, I feel. <laughs> um, so in terms of people making that first step, um, and, and, and sometimes a few people mentioned in the questions, sometimes it's getting your first interview, it's getting your CV looked at, it's, you know, getting your foot in the door for that first interview. Um, and, and I'll come to you first tomorrow because, you, you know, you mentioned it about getting skills across on the CV. Have you got any tips for people around their CVs uh, in terms of, you know, what you look for, you know, what they should include, shouldn't include? Um, and yeah, what would help, do you think, from that side of things? Yeah, um, and, and I suppose if, I know one of the things and I've seen some of the questions that are coming through so I'll, I'll probably angle it a little bit more in this direction is that it's that how do you get how do you get yourself noticed when you've not done the data role before if, if it's your first role um and so um I, I think the first thing to sort of get across is like if if you're if I'm a hiring manager looking for a, a, an entry level position then I'm not necessarily looking or expecting somebody to be coming in with all of that experience you know so it's there is an element of like the company managing their expectation of what they're looking for if they're looking for a junior you're looking for somebody that's sort of starting out and so you might not all have that practical experience but that said you know as Clement sort of mentioned you know we we all do a lot of the things that are required for the job in in various other aspects if you've had if you've done a dissertation or if you've done you know if you're doing a um a master's of some sort or a course in which it involves group work then of course you would have been through and experienced elements of like communication and presentation and potentially working you know in challenging circumstances and so those are some of the things that you can um, sort of communicate and bring out on your CV because given the context of what your of what your experience to date is those are real examples of how you've leveraged um, those skills mm -hmm. and, and then and equally then talking about how you uh, what you were managed to achieve as part of those those projects and what result it sort of led to I think you know within any job if you can hang on what you've managed to achieve on your CV that to me really, really sort of stands out. And I, I mean it a bit more broader than I, like I built a model and it was 87% accurate. I mean, I mean, I, I delivered this model, it was 80% accurate and it led to X percent increase on those things. Those are the sort of like the tangible results that really sort of like stand out on a CV. But like I say, when you're starting out, except that, you know, you haven't got necessarily those experiences, you, you need to be creative about how you communicate it with what you have done, but also that I know that I'm not looking for somebody that's got that experience too. Yeah. Oh, the commercial awareness, I think, is a is a great tip actually. And, and taking it back to that real life, I've saved the company half a million pounds. <laughs> you know, it's it, you know, it's, there's a reason for you being there. So, uh, in terms of yourself, Armin, uh, obviously, I'm assuming in your role as data science manager, uh, you look at a lot of CVs. Uh, what what stands out for you? In in CVs, I, I usually I pick up the uh, uh, the highlights. Um, um, I, honestly, I don't rely too much on CVs. I usually want to see if there's a sign of uh, this CV reflects someone who's passionate, someone who um, thrives for success. Um, I would just accept it to go for a telephone call. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why um, I may not be the best person for the CV because I don't put my 100% attention on CVs. Okay. But I would talk about when you are going to the next step. And this is for me is more of a sales. This is, uh, I believe, one of the most important skills that everyone needs to have in life is a sales skills. So we need to understand if you are going to offer your service to someone else, learn how you are going to communicate it, how you are going to sell your service to someone before noticing you very well. And for a sale, you need to have a really good communication skill. So you see, even before starting your data science career, you need to start with some soft skills beforehand. And that's something that you can just work on and, and learn out of it. And that's why when someone come to, to this uh, conversation for, um, um, for, uh, for an interview, I would see how much passionate about yourself, how, how much do you believe in yourself? 
how do you see yourself in terms of the mindset? Do you have a growth mindset? Are you passionate about learning something that you are not uh, comfortable with? And this, these are the things that I, I care the most and I try to uh, seek in one person's ideas. And, and finally, if you are coming at the door and you are going to speak, making sure that you don't talk about the things that you have done, because we know that we don't have always the possibilities to explore and, and do uh, amazing jobs, but you can think of how you would have done it if you had more time, more resources, more tools, and et cetera, et cetera. So think about the future as well. Just don't look back. Talk about yourself as you would have an opportunity to look forward. Perfect. I feel like I need a sales mentor and I might have just found one. <laughs> I feel like I need to follow up with you, Armin. This is perfect for me. Um, I'll maybe come to one of you two, Fergus or Clement, and I might even just flick it around again, playing devil's advocate, devil's advocate again. Is there anything that you ever see on a CV that's an instant no, instant turn off? Um, I'll go to you first, Fergus, if that's okay. Or, or if uh, not, if there's any tips again that you would look for rather than that, I've, I've flipped it a little bit on its head there for you. Uh, <clears throat> this might seem a bit controversial, but I'm always wary of um, of Coursera courses or MOOCs that people have done um, for the very reason around that it's so far removed from the real world mm -hmm. that um, it can it can lead people astray into thinking they're really good at something um, in a sandbox but actually in the real world it's very different mm -hmm. and something I've said uh, something I've said to all of my teams before is that it might seem like a really sexy job, but you really want to work in data if you want this job because it's really hard and you have to have perseverance to do that. There will be times when you want to give up, but where you make your money is in the times at which you want to quit <laughs> or you want to not push through on your problem. That's when you make your money. It's not for the 90% of your day-to-day -day job that's really easy. We pay you to get past that wall and deliver on the project that you promise. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I, I am wary about, I am wary about uh, people putting just MOOCs down. And I think the other thing um, that really gets to me in an interview, especially in technical interviews, is somebody puts down a keyword or like a buzzword and then they can't explain it. It's like if somebody uses random forest, just, just so everybody's aware, if you put random forest on your CV, I'm going to ask you how it works. So be be fully prepared. Um, <laughs> that's that's to, had thumbs to, up to, from everyone. <laughs> to to back up your statements on your CV. Um, like I totally appreciate that people embellish, and people lie a little bit on your CV. That's great. That's the sales bit, right? But when you get in that door, if you put it on your if you put it on your CV, I'm going to ask you about it. And typically, the way I would run my initial interviews is that we'll just focus on your most recent experience. And from that, I get all of the soft skills because you're telling me a story. And then we get to go all, we get to go through the specifics of what you've just talk, talked to me about. You, random forest, SQL, all of those things, we can gauge a good understanding just from that 30 minute conversation of how much is truth and how much is you selling. Perfect, it's good to hear. Uh, I'll come to you quickly on this one, Clements, and then we'll, we'll change tack a little bit from there if that's okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, most of the things have been said. One thing I'm very wary of uh, is um, somebody that can list you all the technology in machine learning. You know, they've used Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, Lasagna, and, and M MXNet, and they also use AWS, GCP, and Azure, and they use everything. And you're like, mate, I've got 10 years experience and I haven't used all that. I don't think it's gonna work for me. <laughs> so I guess there's, there's, there's that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the, to the later stage, when you actually have a face-to-face um, -face interview or um, a technical interview around machine learning, uh, I do like to ask you what's your favorite algorithm and uh, use that as a, okay, so now explain to me how it works. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I like people to be able, uh, I want somebody that, that is able to stop me right away and tell me, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, if you're not able to answer that, 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 that means at some point in the project, you're gonna lie to me about something that happened and that is going, that is going wrong. And, that, and, you're go, and that, that's for me, it's big no. 
And I think, for, I mean, from that perspective, we were very lucky to have great speakers throughout the festival. And there'll still be times in the questions where people say, do you know what, I need to come back to you on that one. You know, not everyone knows all the answers all the yeah. time, do they? And these are industry leading experts, you know, so, that, so don't be afraid to do that. Can I, um, can I, can I just say something on that? Just it, when you're, sorry, sorry Amin, just um, on what Clement said. I think if you if you get a question that you can't answer, probably the best piece of advice I can give you is try to put a framework around how you might answer it. All right, so don't just say, I don't know, or try to muddle your way through figuring it out. Actually try and articulate a framework because it's the ability to kind of put, put what you don't actually know into some sort of organizational structures so that you can clearly communicate. It's probably the best thing I've seen from candidates who, who just don't know the answer, but they do try and put a framework around how they may do it if they if they did have that experience. Can I just like piggyback a little bit more even on that because because it's a really really good piece of advice because the reality is on on each day to day you won't know the answers to all of the questions in doing the job and so and, and no one would expect you to but if you don't have a way of thinking about how you'll get the answer, then you're going to get stuck constantly and will always need support. If you are showing that you can think your way out of a problem and, and how you would go about it, then you know that it doesn't really matter what sort of problems you're going to come up against, even if you don't know the answer there and then you're going to be able to try and sort it out for yourself. Perfect. And Armin, was there something from you there? Yes. I think I made it brutally honest in my presentation. I said that this toolbox in the beginning is almost empty. We know that they have been all there. So we know that gradually you are going to learn. So we start at some point and just focus on the thing that you know. If you don't know something, simply say, I don't know, but I would, I would be thrilled to learn and, and know more about it if it's necessary. Perfect. Now I've got what. Not the end part, it's more about the aptitude and the like the excitement to learn something you don't have it there and then but where are you showing your eagerness to to learn it i think at that that early stage perfect thank you and um, i'll go to one more question about this and then we'll, we'll actually flick tack a little bit and we'll talk a bit about uh, actually a lot of what armin was talking about there about the career path once you're in and stuff like that so uh, one final question in terms of that first role uh, it's from brandon charles uh, he's basically saying i'm doing an msc in data science uh, at the moment uh, do you think it, it's advisable to accept an analyst role uh, as my first role even if my goal is actually to be a data scientist should people be shooting to be a data scientist straight off the bat or do you need to get into a different role first? And I'll come to Fergus because he unmuted, which has indicated he has an opinion for me. Yeah, um, I think just going back to what I mentioned earlier around the fact that data science as, a, as an area is ill-defined. In some businesses, a data analyst or product analyst will be classed as a data scientist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So data scientists nowadays do encapsulate what would have been traditionally called product analysts or, or data analysts. So I think you need to, I would, the advice I'd give you is think about what you want to do. So based on that question, I imagine it's more on the modeling side, maybe, or the machine learning side, which will take you down a very different track in terms of the business you may go to and the jobs you might apply for. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I uh, think there's also a fact of, make sure that your ambition match what's what's offered to you because if an analyst job in the company you're looking at is looking at a dashboard and saying oh yesterday was two percent lower tomorrow we expecting it to be one percent higher then it might not be what you want to do and it, the title doesn't matter you could call it a ceo of the company it's still not what you want to do so title are still a, a bit of a, a, a sometimes misleading but if you're able to say okay as an analyst what i will do is that that's what i want to learn that's what i want to do then yes go for it it doesn't matter if it's data scientist because tomorrow when you want to leave that company uh, and hopefully it's not after six months uh, because you actually hate the job it's it, there's also that you will be able to get a, a, a job by saying uh, um, I have accomplished that because it doesn't matter what was the title or what you accomplished for, uh, and, and so on so I guess it's very much finding the right match more than anything else Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll come to you next, uh, Armin, uh, in terms of, uh, I think a lot of people, you, you caught their eye in terms of your thinking of that iteration around to continually approve, uh, mapping out where you're lacking, uh, coming up with a plan and stuff like that. Um, 
I guess in terms of doing that, uh, one of the questions we've had come in, I've lost the person that asked it, but they were actually asking, you know, can you get through those processes quicker? You know, can you move through the career quicker and get to the top quicker? Uh, you know, what, is there value in doing it slower? Uh, have you got any more tips around, you know, mapping out that path and taking ownership of it? Uh, actually, I, I saw that question, uh, how to make it quicker. I think uh, part of it, yes, you can do it quicker if, if you spend more time on it. And, but is it something that, that makes you happy? So you, this is you that need to answer that question yourself. What do you want in your life? Sorry, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit philosophical because this is what I'm... <laughs> so you really think what you are going to pay if you are going to make it quicker. Are you going to get, give up your, your health? You are going to give up your, your fun and everything? But, but if that's make you happy, just, just spend more time. However, mentor is going to help. So mentors can help you to uh, something that you, 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 you didn't know exactly what, you, what to do. They would guide you through so you, make it, you may make it quicker. So getting a mentor, I think it's, it's re really important. And we are living in an era of uh, MOOCs. Uh, there's so, uh, so many resources out there that if you are going to learn something new, just, just go there and find. But if, usually when I, uh, when I talk about people, if you are going, to, if you are a kind of ambitious person that wanna move fast to the ladder of corporate or something, uh, you need a mentor, but that is not gonna be sufficient. You need a sponsor as well. So mentor is someone who has gone through this pass, passage. So he knows the way and help you to, uh, to tell you which, which step to take, what learn, what to do that, that help you out there. But if you're thinking about going to the ladder of the responsibilities and ownership and moving up, you, what you need is a sponsor. And sponsor is someone in the organization that is highly influential. People, people respect his, his decisions. And that person might be your manager, if you're lucky, or it might be a manager of your manager or the boss of your manager of your manager. So if you are going to have someone who knows you, if you are talking about random forest, it reminds you, you need to present yourself. So whenever you do a job, write a report, make, your, make sure that your manager is happy, you go and present it somewhere, you, you, you put it out there that people hear you, people hear your name, that you are the one who delivered very well and do the hard work, enjoy it, what you're doing and it's going to be fast and it's going to be enjoyable as well, why not? Perfect, thank you. Uh, I will actually come to the others here as well because uh, I, I must admit it's probably more reflection on me than anything else, but um, well, it's definitely a reflection on me because uh, I moved from being a data engineer to running a recruitment business. So that, that wasn't on any sort of roadmap for anyone, I don't think. Um, it, how much of, of you other panelists planned your career path you know did you set it out 10 years ago uh, or have you kind of you know planned as you've gone and stuff like that so just just more point of interest for me rather than anything else so i'll come to you first tamara um what, what's your thought in terms of planning out that career path and and how do you view it I'm still making it up as i go along um <laughs> i mean no I, i've always been guided more by what i enjoy doing i probably you know because you know you spend a lot of time at work and so you want to you know get satisfaction and enjoyment out of doing the things that you do and so you know I, I did you know maths at uni and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do and so then well to be honest because I really didn't know what I wanted to do I kicked the can down the road and did a master's you know because I thought maybe within a year I'll figure it out and 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 I've always, you know, and then at some point I sort of realised I quite liked, you know, doing modelling and, and data stuff, you know, and, and giving results based on fact rather than plucking things out of thin air. So I thought of went, OK, well, that sounds all right, but I don't really know what industry I want to be in. And so I did consulting for a bit. And in and, and each step, it's always been a little bit like, oh, I quite like this. So I'd start doing a little bit more of it. And then it starts to inform where I might want to, to do things next. When I was at Channel 4, I realised I quite liked managing and mentoring others, but that wasn't actually, an, you know, there wasn't the opportunity there for me. Yeah. So that's why I took the move to go to Netta Porter. And then yeah. when I went to Netta Porter, I realised I really liked bringing together the data parts of it and the data science part of it, you know, and I was like, right, well, okay, I'll go and do that then. And then I went to 
uni days and and at uni days are, um, and what's quite nice you know it's a small company I'm getting to experience lots of different th things that are ne not necessarily in data even yeah. and, and maybe who knows what that will lead on to but I've always Enjoy. been trying to buy by what I've enjoyed doing. Enjoy the journey I like the sound of that so uh, I'll come to you Clemens in terms of building your career uh, what, what, what's the thinking what's the plans have you got any tips? So, so for, for me it's even like uh when when I hear people talking about career change, it, it always uh, reminds me of uh, when I when I finished my uh, my high school, I I decided to do uh, med school, and I did uh, and I did pass med school, and I went to uh, to become a, a midwife. So career change, here I am. Uh, and so basically, I did, I did two years. I uh, yeah, uh, my, my my highlight is I delivered twenty babies uh, on my own, but uh, <clears throat> I, I decided that it wasn't for me. So um, I was lucky that I discovered that when I was still uh, at university, pretty much. And I said to my parents, well, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. So uh, but for, for whatever reason, I was lucky that I, have a, I had a couple of friends that were doing economics and in particular uh, econometrics. And I found that fascinating. So I kind of it, it put me on the path of, uh, of data science, machine learning. And from there, uh, I went to uni and all that. But for, for a long time, I wanted to be, a, after that, I wanted to be a, a university professor in uh, microeconomics. I was fascinated by microeconomics, still is. And it's, it's basically, a lot of it is around modeling uh, economy and uh, using data. And then I went from there and, and, and so on. And uh, I did a course that was applied econometrics uh, at the end of my master. And that was pretty much what uh, the, the basis of machine learning for, for, for a lot of things. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's what I wanted to do. And then for the rest, the, you know, going to companies, different industry and all that, it was very much like, I love fashion or, oh, I like that. Oh, I'm going to try that. Oh, I think it's nice to have that as well. Uh, and so on. So some of it was somewhat planned, but a lot of it was, okay, what am I going to enjoy? Because I'm going to have to do it for a long time. And uh, unfortunately, today you don't retire at fifty, so uh, <laughs> and you do have to do it for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that that's kind of how I became that. Perfect. Uh, in terms of yourself, Fergus, uh, we'll, we'll take your opinion on this, and then we'll wrap things up with one question for, from all of you. Uh, in terms of your career path, how, how structured has that been, and you know what 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 have you enjoyed along the way? Have you got any tips in terms of you know that you've learned as you've gone through your career? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, so I started out in engineering in robotics. Um, and then I came to London and I originally started as a design engineer for s steel structures. <laughs> um, so very different to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis now. And I think kind of my step forwards into kind of the world of data was just by luck. Um, so part of why I'm here today is based on the decision I made a long time ago. Um, in a pub in Clapham, but that's for another that's for another day. Um, I think two things that kind of stuck with me that whole time. One is that I was never really worried about the money. Um, like I was always driven by what I what made me the most happy in my in my in my job in my day to day. Um, and I I see everybody else nodding their heads, and I think that if you focus on the money too early, actually you in the long run you'll 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 probably have um your expected return will probably be less in your career than if you focused on your career initially um and then the, i suppose the second thing is considering each move and being deliberate about the moves that you make so i think when i moved from you know i started my career very much at dunhumby um in the early 2000s and um, from there, I moved to another bit and a more, a much bigger American business doing very similar things. But at that point, I made the decision that I wasn't going to take a job that wasn't based on a, a, either an e-commerce or in, in or a more like an online business. So moving into much more of the big data. And that was a very deliberate decision. And I suppose from there, moving into uh, that role, and I've been in those types of big data businesses ever since. So be it Wonga, Trainline, or now Future Publishing. So they've always been deliberate steps and well-considered. It's never really been about the money. It's been about what's the right thing at this point in time for my career. 
Uh, yeah, uh, sounds very, very sensible, actually. Um, I I'm going to wrap things up uh, a little bit conscious of time. So we'll maybe just make this super quick fire round with just two minutes to go. Um, we've talked a lot about companies looking at um, CVs, companies looking at um, you know skills and stuff like that, but it's obviously not a one-way process. If you're in the candidate's position, what, what is the one question that you as a candidate would potentially ask a potential employer um, to, to make sure it's you know potentially right for you or get the information that you want from them uh, for that two-way uh, sort of transaction. Uh, I'll come to you first, Tamara. Um, have, you, have you got you know one question that you think you should ask as a candidate? Let's look down the, the list of questions that I think people should ask. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. Share them with the other panelists. <laughs> right. Uh, this, um, if I was to go back to this idea of like you're there to sort of deliver that that value and and whether there's the right sort of match between what you can do and and what the team is expecting of this role then I would ask like what like what is the priorities of the business for the next six months or year and how does this team and this role help in in delivering that perfect that is a very good tip uh, I'll come to you Clements then Fergus and then finish with Armin if that's okay uh, usually one that I like to ask personally or that I like to be asked, uh, I think it, it shows that you, you thought about the role is about um, wh what is your, uh, what is the expectation for the specific position for the first three months and what do you expect the function this role is going to leave in to deliver in like a year or you know a year from now where do you expect this the functions to be i think that's quite that's quite important perfect thank you very much fergus uh similar to what the previous guys have just said but it's really around um what does success look like for this role so what what is it like how would the hiring manager define success for for that role in six to 12 months time thank you armin to finish up with you they, they said my, my question. But, okay. <laughs> uh, this is what happens how when you come last. Successful candidate. How do you give me the excellent score in one year time? What, what would I have done? Mm. Yeah, good, good takeaway, 100% for sure. So, uh, well, we've been very lucky, everybody, to have these four people uh, with us uh, for 90 minutes uh, sharing their skills and experience. So uh, if you don't mind, if you could just drop a little message in the chat uh, just to say thanks or, hey, I'm here or clap or whatever. Uh, it's been really nice. It's difficult uh, when you're in an online environment to get a round of applause. So here's your virtual round of applause, everybody. So uh, we've had you know, nearly 300 people join us. We've had stacks of questions. I've not got to all of them. So actually I will follow up afterwards and uh, print these off and share them with the guys uh, maybe turn it into a blog post or something like that as well. Um, just to wrap up, guys, thank you very much. As I say, I'm aware it's 90 minutes of your time. Really appreciate your input. Um, in terms of the festival schedule, this is a really nice mix to you know, bring it in in terms of the real world. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have uh, all enjoyed it. And hopefully we get to do this live at some point uh, in the future as well. So thank you very much to all of you guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Well, catch you all later. And thank you for joining us at home. Uh, hopefully see you at some more of our festival events over the rest of the month. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Yes. Next time. Bye-bye.